Welcome to Textimation. Joining us is Ryan Pamplin, the CEO and founder of BlendJet. Thank you for joining us, Ryan. Thank you so much for having me, Fred. Great to be here. Well, this is a big day for you. Brand new version of the BlendJet coming out. But first, let's, let's talk a little bit of background. Uh, BlendJet is a really interesting company that has a, an interesting, very personal history. Thanks. Yeah, it's true. It's a very exciting day. We started in 2017 and uh, felt that, uh, you know, for me personally, I wanted to help people live longer and healthier lives. And, and that didn't just come out of nowhere. Unfortunately, I had a freak accident and uh, had a head injury, cracked my head open, nearly died. Ended up on medical leave for a year. I was actually working on building the first holographic computer. We had raised a hundred plus million dollars from top tier VCs in the world, and uh, you know, seeing and touching holograms, giving keynotes with Bob Iger and Steve Wozniak, and getting to work personally with Tim Cook. It was uh, it was a Silicon Valley dream come true, but. Unfortunately, it all came to an abrupt halt when I uh, had my accident and then couldn't even think straight or speak correctly or, you know, talk the way I normally do. I couldn't, uh, couldn't read or watch TV for the first three months. So it was really bad. And it took about a year to get back to normal. Uh, you just, you kind of get used to it, but the symptoms go away. So it got better. And when it got better, the company had been acquired and I wasn't sure what I was going to do next. And I reconnected with my old buddy, John, and I had shown him Facebook ads 10 years before he started his own agency, helped launch a bunch of huge companies with, uh, you know, social media marketing. And he said, what are you going to do next? And I said, well, I'm going to work with you. And uh, I, I knew that all I really cared about post injury was not making money. I mean, it's great to have a business that's viable, that makes money so you can continue but the number one goal was not monetary. The number one goal was really truly to help people live longer and healthier lives. And, you know, he asked me what I wanted to do. And I said that, and he thought that was really profound. And we started talking about our own lives. And he said, you know, I use uh, Jamba Juice every day. I go to Jamba Juice and I spend $7 on a smoothie. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's got a shot of protein added in. And that's what I do after the gym. And he said, if I could just snap my fingers and have a smoothie anywhere, like, you know, this, then that would be, uh, that'd be magic. And I said, well, look, I mean, I don't think we can teleport smoothies quite yet. It's 2020, we're getting there. But I think what is possible, and actually that was 2017, uh, but what is possible is maybe building a portable blender. And he said, wow, do you think we could really do that? And I said, well, look, if we could build the holographic computer at the last company, I'm very sure we could build a portable blender. And, you know, he and I both felt really compelled to actually just do it. You know, I mean, it was one of those ideas, you hear it and you just know it's gonna work. And maybe that was uh, naive, but we believed it and we put our money uh, where our mind was and we invested in building this thing. So brought together the team, the first sort of four was my, my, my wife. She was my girlfriend at the time. She's our uh, VP of customer experience and star of our videos. We were literally filming a Blendjet 2 ad until uh, 2.30 in the morning last night, started at 9 a.m. the day before. So uh, she definitely burns the midnight oil and is one of the founding team members. And uh, also Brian Zook, who is uh, our VP of Ops and interviewed in the beginning 75 different manufacturing partners to actually make this idea into a real thing. So when we started, it was early 2017, uh, you know, had the idea really fleshed out um, by the end of the year and started making them and selling them in June of 2018. That was our first 7,000 units sold out in the first three weeks. By the end of 2018, hundred thousand customers in a hundred countries. And then by the end of last year, over a million, uh, customers in 195 countries. And now, and that was all Blinjet one and Blinjet one. It's great. It's an MVP. And, uh, I mean, I love the product. Uh, but it's not your kitchen blender, right? It's not trying to be your kitchen blender. It's a portable blender. So you sacrifice some power for the convenience and that's okay for a smoothie or a protein shake. But with Blendjet 2, we do not sacrifice power. We have created big blender power on the go. And the way we do that is actually through uh, what we call turbojet technology. So inside of the Blendjet, 
there's a blade and the blade is actually not in the center, it's offset. We actually have a patent uh, on this, several patents that are granted. And we're the first people to come up with this concept of moving the blade off center. What that does is it creates this tornado effect that slams all the ingredients against the back wall of the jar 275 times per second. And as a result of that, it is a dramatically faster and better blend. It's not just brute force, more battery, more power to the motor. I mean, we do that too, but that in combination with that offset blade, it is a game changing technology that really does make every other blender obsolete because they're just nowhere near as efficient. That's really amazing that, that you've been able to do that. I guess your competition initially was the traditional shaker cup that people, you know, would, <laughs> yeah. you know there's a little ball in it or whatever yeah. to, to shake it, shake up your smoothie. And that left lots of clumps and things like that in there. So you came out with a better way to do it. And now 2.0, are there other differences between besides more power? Absolutely. So it's got, you know, overall, when you hold it, I mean, it just feels, I mean, I think you've held it. It just feels nice. It feels solid. It's got this beautiful ring of light on the front. So when you do turn it on and you blend, you've got this, you know, animation here. It's really nice. It's also got USB-C and that's actually waterproof. This is one of the first products with a waterproof USB-C port, which is really cool. I literally had to go to the factory where they create all these ports for all the smartphones and talk to them and negotiate with them to make us one of the first customers to be able to use this. And the whole thing is actually water resistant. So if you dropped it in the pool by mistake, no problem. Uh, we don't recommend it, but technically uh, it is the best blender for mermaids. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it's also got a couple modes. So single button operation is really important. Uh, but we wanted to add some additional features. So for example, if I double press, now I'm in pulse mode. Let's say I'm making a pesto or a guacamole. Now I can go pulse, 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 and I can make the perfect consistency and I'm not over blending, which is really neat. Another thing is if I want to drink out of it right now, I can just unscrew the lid and drink out of it, which I will, because I need this, it's coffee. It's actually oat milk with a little bit, it's an espresso shot oat milk, um, a little bit of vanilla, cinnamon, and a drip of maple syrup. Great morning sort of frappuccino alternative if you can't get to Starbucks because we are in a pandemic after all. Um, but let's say I want to drink out of it and I just don't want to worry about accidentally turning it on because it would go everywhere. That'd be terrible. Uh, you could actually hold down and now you've got lock mode. And what's cool about this is if I were to accidentally turn it on like that, it doesn't turn on. So now I'm safe to unscrew it and drink straight from the jar like this. Cheers delicious, of course. And it's got this nice icy consistency because it really can crush ice. I mean, you load this thing up with your liquid, your milk, your water, your juice, whatever you're mixing with, and you load it up with ice, it can crush it all. Frozen fruit, no problem. Really anything you can do in a big blender, you can now do on the go. And I mean, there's no cord. Of course, to recharge USB-C, one hour of charging gets you 15 plus blends. But if you want to take this to the beach, you want to take it to work, you want to take it traveling. We have a ton of people who prior to the pandemic and probably still now, uh, our pilots and flight attendants. Uh, we have a lot of you know, moms, a lot of women who use it at home at lunchtime, make things for the kids, make baby food, take it to work. The, the most popular use case actually of anything is taking it to work and making a smoothie at work. And interestingly, during the pandemic, people have continued to use it at lunchtime at home. And I think the real reason is it's very convenient. It's much more convenient to use this than a big blender because this is really easy to clean. You just had a drop of soap, water, blend, and it cleans itself. Whereas with a big blender, it's just a lot of surface area to clean. It takes a long time. It's very difficult to uh, get sparkling clean, but we designed it to be easy to clean. And I think that's one of the things that I know from my own experience, I hated about a big blender. And for me, I did protein shakes and smoothies every single day during my recovery. So I was willing to go through the trouble because I needed the nutrients. I felt like that was, you know, how I was going to get better. Um, but I think everything that people hate about blenders, we've addressed. And I think everything that we heard about Blendjet 1, you know, gee, I wish I had more capacity. Well, it has 33% more capacity. Now you're at 16 ounces. And you also have the uh, measurement markings on the back of the jar, which you may or may not be able to see here. Sure. But those make it really convenient to follow recipes. <laughs> and um and you the, know, the, power. the capacity is a little bigger than the previous. Yeah, you know. yeah, exactly. So 12 ounces before, 16 ounces now. And amazingly, it's kind of insane. 
but we figured out how to increase capacity without increasing the height of the product. So the dimensions are roughly the same. The box size is actually the same box. This is a Blendjet 2 box, but the Blendjet 1 box is identical in size to the Blendjet 2 box. And in fact, we won an award for this box, which is so funny. Not really the box, but the product, the company. And it, it was actually because of Brian Zook, our VP of Ops. When we created the product, one thing we realized is we have to do free shipping, free two-day shipping everywhere. How can you do that economically when you're starting out? So what Brian figured out was, let's design our product to fit inside of USPS flat rate packaging. So United States Postal Service. And in fact, we did that. And it fits down to the millimeter in the USPS packaging. And as a result of that, it's very cost effective for us to ship and it's very reliable, even during the pandemic. Uh, priority mail has been great. So we're, you know, kind of designed from the beginning to have a business model that we believed would take off and one that could get to people reliably. And in fact, we also are able to do free worldwide shipping. So people all over the world can get this thing for free. And in some markets, we literally would lose money in the early days to build up enough demand to then go partner with a fulfillment partner in that region to then ship to the customers. But we really wanted to make this something that anybody can buy. And we wanted to make it really accessible, right? This is a $39 product in Blendjet 1. Blendjet 2, it's literally five times more powerful, but it's not five times more money. It's only $10 more. So $49 comes in 16 different colors. We listen to our customers. We hear, you know, people want every color of the rainbow. And we had 14 colors of Blendjet 1. Now we have a couple extras. And, uh, you know, I think people will be very excited about a lot of these colors because they've been asking for them and we're going to deliver. I imagine there, there are quite a few people who would say, okay, this this one here is for my guacamole. This one here is for my coffee. Even though you can wash them pretty thoroughly, um, if you're using garlic and stuff like that, maybe, <laughs> you, maybe you want a separate one for the for cooking. Yeah, I think you know it's interesting because you don't really need a separate one, but if you want one, by all means, go for it. Uh, you know the the product does a great job of being clean. You know, I, I do the smell, I do the smell test a lot, you know, when we're testing just to make sure that after I clean, it really does get clean. And I think we're really careful in terms of material selection to not have any kind of porous materials that would absorb odors and keep those. Um, but I think if you want to um, have different ones for different occasions, it's just more convenient to have that one in your kitchen and then have one at your desk at the office. You know, a lot of people do that. And some people have one in their gym bag and a lot of families have multiple. And actually one of my favorite things to do during the pandemic, you know, we've been quarantined since March. You know, we decided to do it ourselves. Uh, our executive team is all working from home. We, we're, we're a small team relative to the size of our operation. So, you know, we don't wanna be in a situation where any of us get sick and, and are out because that would be detrimental. So we've been really careful and, um, I've done a couple socially distanced, uh, you know, get togethers with other couples. So my wife and I, and to be really careful when people come over, we go in the backyard, we sit far apart from each other. And then we give everyone for a cocktail, their own blend jet. And we put the ice and we put whatever they want. Some people like tequila, some people like rum. And look, we're all about health, but I gotta say at the end of the day, a little tequila is not bad for mental health. Uh, you know, Ellen DeGeneres did a margarita with a blend jet on her show. You know, she was an inspiration to me. Uh, although I know, you know, maybe some, some, uh, some flack now, but this was, you know, <laughs> back in the good days of Ellen before, before she had any issues, but you know, you do one, one margarita per person and, um, and, and everybody kind of makes their own or, or whatever daiquiri or whatever they want. And it's just really nice because, you know, they can have their exact recipe they want. Uh, and they, are sort of sitting, you know, apart and it's not really, it's just fun for entertaining to have, you know, each person with their own color, you know, like, okay, mine's the blue one, yours is the green one. Um, it works well in this type of situation. And it kind of, it kind of makes it fun to have socially distanced drinks, you know? Absolutely. I mean, we have to find ways to get together. We may be Maybe socially distanced isn't the right phrase anymore. It's physically distanced, but socially together or something like that. <laughs> I like that. I think that's a, that's a good point. And uh, yeah, I think you got to find, 
you know, a, a great friend of mine, uh, Adam Shire, uh, creator of Siri, mentor to me, uh, great friend and, you know, someone that we recently socially distanced with. That's something he said to me early on in the pandemic that really hit me. Uh, he said, you got to find a way to enjoy, you know, something each day. And that, that kind of resonates in my mind all the time. And throughout this whole process of this pandemic we've all been in, it's interesting because we're all going through this in the whole world together, except for New Zealand. Um, <laughs> and, and they won't let you know, us in. <laughs> right. I know. I've been looking, I'm checking the website every day. When are you going to let me in? Um, but I, I think, you know, you can look at it terribly and be really bummed about it. Or in my case, I'll be honest with you, this has been a boon to my productivity and our business has been booming during this time, you know, and we're, we're just trying to keep up and, you know, keep the supply chain strong. And at the end of the day, you know, we're trying to create a product that I don't really care if the product sells. What I care about is that the product sells and then it becomes a part of people's daily routines. You know, uh, that is how you create a brand that's gonna still be around in a hundred years because you create habits. And, you know, there's about a thousand people, including you, who have had a Blendjet 2 before we officially have launched it. And the most interesting thing about the data from all the tests is how habit forming it's been for people, much more so than Blendjet 1. I mean, Blendjet 1, a lot of people are addicted to, use it every day. It's a great addiction, you know, makes them healthier. But you know, maybe they still go back to their big blender because they want to do something really hard, you know, pineapple core or something that Blendjet 1 just couldn't do. A lot of people tell me with Blendjet 2, they like to put dates in it, which uh, I love dates in my smoothies. So that's a nice addition to any recipe instead of sugar or maple syrup. But um, I think to make something that is so versatile, it, it's kind of like computers, right? They used to take up a whole room and then they're on your desk and now they're in your pocket. As the form factor has changed, we have seen a dramatic shift in the versatility, in the number of use cases, and in the frequency of use. And that's what we've done for blenders. We've cut the cord, we've liberated the blender from the kitchen, now it can go with you anywhere, and that has a fundamental change in how you use it. And you know, I think the real competition is not other blenders. You know, we're far outpacing the growth of any other blender company in the world. We're the number one most popular blender on social media of any blender brand, including, you know, brands that have been around for a hundred plus years. Um, how, how could we possibly do that? You know, it's not, it's not uh, an accident. And it's also um, not because people really want a blender. Most people aren't even in market for a blender. It's really because it becomes this, part of people's lives and their routines and their lifestyles. And then they tell everybody else, people see them with it. They tell their friends about it. There's a huge part of our business where, uh, you know, the virality of, of the product and the recommendations of friends that just drives an enormous amount of business for us. I mean, nothing is more credible than your friend recommending something. Um, so we're really excited to put out this new version because it is just on another level. I mean, I love my old product. It's a great product. It's, uh, it's is that like being replaced in stores? Are you still going to sell the original? We'll have Blendjet one for a while, but at some point, you know, Blendjet one will be done and then there will only be Blendjet two. Um, well, tell, tell me about the challenges. I mean, you, you're talking about the pandemic and you're all dispersed. The, the challenges that posed for you in putting together a new product release like this. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. I think, you know, we are a digitally native company. You know, we're a direct to consumer brand. Um, we have a huge retail presence. We're in 50 plus major retailers. Uh, we are in thousands of stores between all those retailers. And surprisingly, a lot of the bigger name retailers continue to do very well and drive a lot of volume. The smaller retailers we're not really in, but I know that those are the ones that are that are you know not doing quite as well because there's more of a consolidation to the bigger retailers. Supply chain is definitely one of the biggest issues. You know, we make a ready to blend smoothie as well that's very popular that we created 
uh, with the people that created some of the most iconic beverages in the world. And it's all made here in California. It's really delicious. It's all real freeze dried fruit. That supply chain is tough. You know, one packet might have 30 ingredients in it, all natural fresh fruit ingredients. Well, where do you get fresh fruit from in a pandemic, right? I mean, there's a lot of issues with, uh, with supply chain for all that. And when you have so many ingredients, one thing can hold up the whole supply chain. So, you know, you, you try to tweak things and you try to test different farmers fruit and see if it tastes the same. And if it does, then you can, you know, use that instead. Um, for the product, we're, we're really lucky because we have just great manufacturing relationships and we're able to, to keep it going. And, you know, we've learned from the past, we've never found the ceiling. Q4 is a crazy time for us. 2019 Q4, we were doing one Blendjet every five seconds on Blendjet.com. Wow. And yeah, it's crazy. And for this Q4, we anticipate a much higher number and uh, low, lower seconds number, but higher number of Blendjet sales. So we're just stockpiling as much as we can uh, Blendjet 2s to, to prepare for the demand and hopefully get one under the tree of everyone who wants one this holiday season. Uh, you know, I think, like my buddy said, everybody's got to find a little joy in each day. And if we can provide a product that makes people have that little bit of joy each day or gives them a nice little refresh or nutrients they need to boost their immunity, uh, you know, help them make that clump free protein shake or chill out with a frozen margarita, no matter the use case, uh, I do think that those things have the propensity to bring joy to people. Do you give you yourself and, and your team a, a little bit of a, a breather here before you start thinking about Blendjet 3 or Blendjet XL <laughs> or, or whatever comes next? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, so I think we already know what we want to build next, right? It's not, it's not something where we finish and then we go back to the drawing board. I have a, a laundry list, 10 years worth of features that I want to build. And there's things we've thought of to build in blenders that no one could even imagine. You know, you could brainstorm all day long and never come up with these things. And there's probably not that many people in the world who have a background of, you know, in my case, I mean, I started a, a creative agency, made TV commercials, you know, for dozens of Fortune 500s, had a Super Bowl commercial. You know, I really understand how to make creative. Uh, and then I created the first software for co-founder of a company that made the software for measuring video ads on the internet, grew from three people in my living room to getting acquired. By the time I left, we were, you know, the acquired company was a thousand plus people, very different organization. So I learned what it was like to be in a big company. And I also learned what it was like to be the market leader because nine out of 10 TV ads went through our software. By the time I left, uh, top hundred thousand actors got paid over a billion dollars a year in royalties. Then I helped raise all that money for building a holographic computer. So I have this experience in hardware, in advertising uh, creation, and also advertising measurement. And then of course, all this experience in direct to consumer. So I have this very strange perspective of all these different sides of the business, which I think are usually siloed within, you know, sure. sort of one mind. And I just have brilliant teammates, you know, my, my team, I love them like family and, you know, our executive team that really makes all the decisions is about 10 people. And there's not really layers of management. It's like, they're the, the creative minds and they're the executors of their creations. And we keep it small and we keep it lean and everyone gets their hands dirty. You know, I literally was holding up uh, a bounce card during the shoot yesterday. Uh, you know, I doubt that the CEOs of other blender brands are, are intimately involved in the production of their ads in that way. Um, and it's not because I'm trying to save money. Uh, I mean, we could pay a PA, but the PA doesn't care, right? The PA is there for a hundred bucks. They're not there to make sure that that video is the best video that we've ever created in the history of the company. And frankly, the best blender ad ever made. And, you know, I look at our new website, it was designed by Pattern, which is one of the best design agencies in the world um, for e-commerce. They designed two out of the top five Shopify sites. It was, a, it was a huge investment to work with them 
And we did that during the pandemic and we did it remotely. And we built this beautiful new web presence. And then we didn't want to just have it as a standard Shopify theme. We wanted to use cutting edge technology. So we used uh, Nacelle, which is an amazing piece of software that is kind of middleware between Shopify and then a front end, which is a PWA, a performance web application, which is a flat file, which is like HTML, JavaScript, the whole site highly compressed into this one file. So when you go to the website and you load it, it loads really fast and it's really beautiful. And it's of course, totally, uh, you know, scaled for mobile or desktop or whatever screen size. And then it's very rich with multimedia, tons of video. You know, there's 16 different points about the Blendjet 2 on the product page. And for every single one, there's a video loop that's just gorgeous. I've never seen a Blender company create something like this. Nobody ever has in, in my, I've never seen it, right? And I've looked at everything out there. The love and the dedication that goes into this, I just don't think people eat, sleep and breathe blenders like we do. And we're really passionate about it. And I'm not passionate about it because it's a blender and I love blenders. I'm passionate about it because of the net impact on the world. And that fuels my mind to race at you know, warp speed 24 seven. I literally wake up in the middle of the night and I think of ideas and I give myself the gusto to open my eyes and pull my iPhone off of the wireless charger, thank God. Uh, if it wasn't wireless, it would definitely fall over a lot more, which it used to before I switched to the wireless charger. But uh, getting it back on the stand without, you know, with the wire, mm, can't do it, not in the dark, in the middle of the night. But uh, pull out my phone and open the notes app and write down, you know, the idea. I come up with ad copy. I come up with ideas for, for ads or videos, recipe ideas, and features for the future product. And, you know, it sounds probably silly and, and like I'm just saying this, but I literally do have dreams about the product and about the future of the product. And there are times that really good ideas come to me in, in that way. And I've made myself really good about capturing them, even when I really would rather keep my eyes shut because we are a small team, and especially right now, you know, a 4 a.m. bedtime. I really would like to go to bed by like midnight or 1 a.m. I'm trying to get to inbox zero every day, which is a constant battle. Although I use superhuman, which helps make it a little bit better. And, um, you know, you got to just put in the crazy midnight hours. I mean, I, I used to do this in earlier in my career where every night I'd stay up all night and work and I could just keep going and going and going, you know, with, with enough smoothies and coffee, uh, frozen coffees, I could still do it, but, uh, not, not like I used to, but I'll tell you what, right now, I don't have time to eat. Uh, so I make a smoothie, you know, and, and I'll do it, you know, drink it while I'm working on the computer and, uh, you know, for the product launch, I mean, we are doing so much. We're doing print, we're doing TV, we're doing direct mail, we're doing podcasts, we're doing streaming audio, we're doing all the social networks. You know, we're already one of the top advertisers on Facebook, but now expanding across all these other channels. And then even things like, you know, ads in the newsletters of publications like the New York Times, you know, homepage of Yahoo, just all of these different places that um, we want to get the word out. So the logistics of all of that, plus the logistics of the new product, launching a new website that is this incredible, beautiful thing that is so fast. But then you think about the 20 plus different things we plug into on the website. And when you're on Shopify, you just click add and it just works. But now that I'm going headless on the front end, the complexity of making all those things work means custom integration with every single one. But the benefit is the user experience is so much better. And it's so clear to me that the future of e-commerce is all going to be headless. There's no way that someone like me can build something that is so much faster and performant, which means ultimately better conversion rate. There's no way that others don't see that and then go, oh, I have to do this. So I think, you know, yes, we're a blender company, but at the same time, we also are very focused on innovation with our own product. And then also with how we present that product, how we reach the audience, how we talk about the product, how we show the product. And, you know, our real competitors just on a customer level are really 
drive throughs more than anything, because your decision often is what am I going to eat for lunch today? And then you're going to make that decision most often based on what's most convenient to you. And for a lot of people going to McDonald's and driving through the drive through is more convenient. And I think we've literally made it easier and more convenient to make yourself a smoothie in a matter of minutes than it is to get in your car and drive through a drive through. And to me, that is, you know, that's the competition. And there's a lot of room to take a lot more, you know, a lot more customers away from them and they'll still be just fine. Your attention to all of this, uh, Ryan, is, is so striking and, and refreshing. Uh, talk to a lot of executives and founders and people who are passionate about their product. Some are more passionate about making a lot of money from it. But to, to have the passion from top to bottom and about what the product stands for seems to be really unique here. And I guess that's going to isolate you or insulate you from the uh, knockoffs that, that uh, surely are out there and, will, and those who are, that are to come. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, we do have quite, quite a few of these. This is uh, one of 45 that have been filed, uh, 10 or more now that have been granted. But, you know, uh, patents are important. But at the end of the day, Chinese knockoffs don't care about patents. You mm -hmm. know, a lot of the marketplaces don't do a good job of policing and stopping knockoffs. You know, we do send 50 plus takedowns per day to people that knock off our product. I think it's going to be really hard to knock off Blendjet 2 because it's a very high quality product. So I don't know if, uh, you know, I don't know if the copycats are going to do as good of a job. We're also much better at protecting our IP now. You know, we have design patents on like every aspect, this, 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 every little piece. So it's just going to be tough for someone to really challenge us in that way. And in fact, we have, very broad patents that cover the concepts of our product, not just, you know, the design. So the, the utility patents on the concept of a portable blender are really going to prevent any serious competition from a major brand for a long time. So we have, you know, a good 20 year period to build this sort of ownership over this new category that we've created. And, you know, I'll tell you, it's really interesting to talk to people who are veterans of the category. There's one of the biggest retailers in the world who uh, I've been talking to, the head buyer for Kitchen, and we have a deal with them. It's signed. We're launching in 2021. And she said to me recently, she said, you know, I'm very confident in Blendjet and I would make a substantial bet on Blendjet, which she is actually by ordering a crazy number of units. And, you know, it's going to be a great partnership. Um, and she said, you know, one thing about it it's the name, you know, it just sounds like the category leader. And I was like, you know, I appreciate that very much uh, coming from you. It means a lot. And there's a great line in this movie um, with uh, Michael Keaton called the founder. It's about McDonald's actually. Right. And at one point somebody says to him, why do you need to buy McDonald's? You know, like just copy them. They don't have anything proprietary. And he goes, well, they have one thing that I can't copy that I need. It's the name. And I think that is, that is so true. It's so important. You cannot build a brand in 2020, a real brand, without an amazing name. And if you don't own your own domain name, you're making it really hard for people to find you. So finding a good name that you can get trademarks on in all the important countries around the world that you can then have the domain name for, it's really challenging. And I think there's a great test for entrepreneurs when you're trying to name something. Look at the list of everyone in the category and then put your name. And if it fits, it's a great name. If it doesn't fit, it's never going to fit. So don't, don't waste your time, right? And I think you've got to set yourself up for success in that way. You know, make something that's really memorable, something that's catchy, something that, you know, looks like it belongs on the top shelf next to the other big names who have been there for 100 years. Um, but yeah, I think you know, retail for us in 2021 is really exciting. It's actually surprisingly very good still in 2020. You know, QVC is an amazing partner for us. We've been on there over 60 times. We had a day that we sold over 100,000 blend jets on QVC. Wow. 100,000, not 100,000 dollars, 100,000 units. Uh, and it was more than that, actually. But it's, it's insane 
the volume that a retailer like that can do. You know, when you look at the big, big retailers who are doing really well, they are really leveraging their email lists. They're really leveraging online marketing channels. And they're really leveraging their stores as warehouses and then offering same day delivery that's actually much more cost effective and efficient than what Amazon is able to do. Because geographically, a lot of them are within three miles of 90% of people's homes. So, you know, it's a, it's an interesting change. And I think you look at the pandemic and you look at retail every year before, and it's been roughly 90% brick and mortar for consumer spending, 10% e-commerce. Now, last year was 88 and 12. Now you're going to see a ridiculous quantum leap in terms of market share of e-commerce for dollars, especially in Q4, because we don't have a choice. And if you look at SARS in 2003 in China, that was the boom of e-commerce in China. Most people had not made a purchase online prior to that. And then during SARS, they didn't have a choice. So everyone started buying things online. And it was really done on mobile more than anything, because a lot of people didn't own a computer. They owned a mobile device. And I think what you're going to see happen here in this country is once habits change, they're not going back. They're going to continue the way that they are working through the pandemic. You know what? I don't need to go to the grocery store. It's a lot more convenient to have the groceries delivered right to my door. And um I think the retailers who are going to be really, really successful in the future are the people who are figuring out how to do what they love to call omni-channel sort of, you know, strategy. Uh, and I'm seeing that work really well. And as a consumer, I'm enjoying it a lot because I didn't necessarily want to have to go pick up the same 20 grocery items that I picked up last week again. If I can just get those delivered, that's very nice. I think the challenge comes now for a lot of brands that have been built traditionally they don't know how to build a direct-to-consumer business. And they're used to launching a new product, giving it to a retailer, customers browsing a store, and then discovering in-store. It's a lot harder to do that now. Um, so I think you know we're in a lucky position to have the expertise to build a D2C brand. And then the halo effect of the success of the direct-to-consumer brand is actually what attracts all the big retailers. Um, you know, and, and I'm very happy to have them because at the end of the day, my conversion rate is very good, but 96% of people that come to my website are not buying my product. 4% are, which is a great number, but you know, for the 96% that don't, next time they're browsing you know, on namethebigretailer.com or walking through the store or going to the store and picking up an item and then they see our end cap and they go, oh, you know what? I saw that online or I'm one of the literally billion plus people that have been reached by a Blendjet video in the last 12 months through Facebook and Instagram alone you know, one in seven people in the world, the friction to pick it up off the shelf and put it in the cart, much less friction than putting your credit card number into a website of a brand that you haven't transacted with before online. So I'm excited for the future, uh, for the brand. I think our expansion into all of these traditional channels in the next couple of years is going to be a huge area of growth and one that's gonna to continue to be more significant than e-commerce as a whole in terms of revenue. Uh, and one that will become more significant for us. But I'm sure direct to consumer, we love the relationship with our consumer. You know, you buy from us, not only do you get a blend jet, but you get free content for your blender every week. You get a recipe video that's super high quality. We spend thousands of dollars a week on making recipe videos that we give away for free. And we do it because we want people to have creative ideas, you know, to make things that maybe they hadn't thought of before. And I think um, that keeps it exciting and interesting and, uh, you know, I'm not going to say we're a content company. Uh, we're, we're definitely a company that makes hardware. And if anything, the software we make is our Jetpack ready to blend smoothies. But I don't care if you make a Jetpack in your blender. It's very convenient. But if you want to put, you know, banana and strawberry frozen, you want to put some dates, you want to mix whatever you want in there, by all means, do it. Uh, and if you're looking for something super convenient and you just don't have time to buy ingredients or you're traveling and you can't bring fresh fruit with you, then Jetpack solves that problem. That's why we created that because all of the mixes and things before, they're fake. It's fake sugar, kind of weird stuff in there that I wouldn't personally ever eat. I'm vegan. I've been vegan for 10 plus years. I'm really careful and conscious of what I put in my body, especially after my injury. Uh, so 
that's kind of just how we are as a brand. Everything we do will always be in service of doing what is in the best interest of the consumer. Cause I use all of our products every day myself. And I really am making this for myself because I know what I want. And I think my desires align with what a lot of other people want to. Well, uh, maybe it's foolish or, or stupid to ask a question like this, but especially considering all the, all of the pain and the, that you went through with the injury and the, the suffering. But do you ever allow yourself to stop and think, what if, if that hadn't happened to you, obviously this whole thing wouldn't exist. True. Yeah, I do think about that a lot. And, and in fact, I think part of the motivation, I mean, I, I've always been a very motivated entrepreneur, right? That's not a problem, but I'm motivated on a different level for different reasons this time. And I think previously the allure of making a lot of money was probably one of the most exciting things. I'll be honest, I don't care. I don't care about the money. Um, my life is, is good. You know, I have a great wife. We live in a, in a nice enough house, you know, I have the car I want. I have good people in my life that I care about. So looking back to the accident, it was really bad. My wife had, she was my girlfriend at the time. She just upgraded from Beverly Hills to Oakland and that's not an upgrade. And, uh, you know, a month into the move, I have this accident and then I, you know, I'm incapacitated for the most part and she's taking care of me and there's no clear sight to when it's going to get better or if it's going to get better. And she stuck by my side the whole time. So I, I'm really super grateful for that. And I felt as I was getting better, I mean, it took like a year when I finally got better. I felt like I had to make it up to her and I had to not only make it up to her, but I had to make it up to myself in a way that I would never look back and be like, ah, I wish that didn't happen. I have zero remorse about slamming my head into the concrete pillar. Would I ever want to go through it again? Absolutely not. Because it wasn't just that I couldn't function properly in a lot of ways, I couldn't think properly. And how did that, losing, how does that happen, Ryan? I was, uh, <laughs> I was watching, I lived in a, in a high rise building with a parking garage underneath. And I was watching my Tesla auto park and I was running backwards in a rush and I flipped around and slammed into a concrete pillar oh at full speed. And I just hit it right here. And just my glasses flew off, my phone flew out of my hand. And I just, the impact was so hard. I just slid it right above my eyebrow wide open. And I thought that I slipped in a puddle of oil that leaked from someone's car. And I got up and I was looking around and I'm in this giant puddle and I'm thinking, man, I'm, I, what a, what a, you know, dumb person to just let their car leak oil everywhere. And, uh, and then I, I touch my head and it's all, it's a little graphic, but it was kind of squishy feeling. And I realized, oh my God, I am in serious, serious trouble. I didn't feel any pain to be honest. Uh, later I felt pain, but at the time I didn't feel any pain. And then I ran to the front desk where I lived and there's a doorman and they said, you're pranking us, you're pranking us. And I said, I'm not pranking you. Please get the first aid kit. I knew I needed to wrap it, you know, because the head is, uh, it bleeds. And uh, my buddy pulled up in his car and I jumped in his car and he rushed me to the hospital. I called Catherine on the way and said, hey, I know you're in San Francisco. She was working at Barry's boot camp when she first moved here. And uh, she loved Barry's. We had to live in Oakland close enough to San Francisco so she could go to Barry's boot camp every day uh, as a customer. And then she's like, well, maybe I should just work here. I go here all the time anyway. So she rushes from, from Barry's to the hospital and everybody's like, you're gonna be fine, you're gonna be fine. I asked my buddy, actually, the one person who was honest with me right away. I said, do you think I'm gonna be okay? He said, I don't think so. And then Catherine gets there, she walks in. She's like, don't worry, you're gonna be fine. They unwrap it and then she loses it. And I'm just like, oh my God, I never looked. I never looked in the mirror ever during this uh, whole day. I didn't want to see it. You know, I didn't want the memory burned in my mind. But after all that was over, after the recovery, it was a lot of suffering. And I haven't even, you know, I barely scratched the surface of, of the torment that I went through and that mm -hmm. she went through and our families. Um, but 
you know, my heart rate would go crazy. My Apple watch would like, you know, ping me that my heart rate is super high and then it would drop really low. And I feel like I'm going to faint and I feel like I'm gonna have a heart attack and it would just blood regulation wasn't working properly. And, um, it's all good now, but having gone through all of that, I really truly felt that I was going to die on many, many occasions. I would go to bed sometimes and I would be losing vision. It'd be tunneling. And I would just feel like this might be it, you know, and I would say good night in a way that I felt like might be the last time. And I made it through it. I'm here. I'm good. And now if my period of suffering, which is over, if that can be over and all of that was for the good of now benefiting millions of people in the world, because I'm able to turn that bad thing into a good thing, I would never undo it. I would never wish to not have gone through it. I don't ever want to do it again. And I don't wish it upon anyone, but the circumstances that that led to were such that I felt compelled. I had to do something extraordinary so that I couldn't sit around and feel sorry for myself and wish that it didn't happen to me. It was a fluke. It shouldn't have happened. It was dumb. You know, it's, it's just a freak accident. It's not even like an accident that, oh, I was skiing down a triple black diamond and I hit my head on a tree. No, I ran into a stupid pole in a parking garage, you know, and it changed my whole life. And Blinjet wouldn't exist if it was not for that. So, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm going to say something weird, but I'm grateful that I, that I had the accident because I think the net impact on the world is far greater. And I think as a human, I probably never would have done something so impactful on people's lives and health. And I think, you know, if we just look at the number of customers, it's hard to calculate, but I think people on average eat much healthier with this product, whether they mean to or not, it just happens. And we don't market it as health, we market it as convenience. That's important. People don't want health as much as they want convenience. So we learned that and, and you know, that was our gut and we went with it and it is true. Health is secondary. Um, but at the end of the day, you market for convenience, you attract a larger audience and then you have a bigger impact on health. I think the real truth is that we're having a huge impact on terms of actual longevity, actual years lived between all the customers, I think it's going to add up to a very substantial number. And that is so fulfilling. You know, I'll be honest, I make a terrible salary. I don't care about the salary, right? I already told you, I'm not in it for the money. I'm in it for the fulfillment and the fulfillment from building this thing and having it impact eating habits and change them in a very permanent way. That is, you know, that's priceless. That's what I'm here for. That's what gets me out of bed every morning. That's how I can stay up till four in the morning and then wake up and, you know, get back to work and try to inbox zero at 9 a.m. multiple days in a row. Um, you know, it's, it's thrilling and it's motivating and it just, it, you just want to do it. It's not a chore. When I'm answering emails, I'm not like, oh, I have to answer these emails. This sucks. I'm like, wow, this is exciting. You know, a lot of the emails we get are from really incredible people, a lot of them cold from nowhere, and a lot of them from customers that just touch you, you know, that just tell you stories about, hey, I had this debilitating thing happen to me and your product's been part of my recovery, you know, or I have, you know, kids at home during, you know, the pandemic and lunch for them every day was really challenging until I found your product. And now, you know, they're making it themselves. I'm supervising and they're using your product and making it every day and you're saving me time and my kid loves it. And, you know, the CEO of Press Juicery, I love Press Juicery. It's uh, very popular in California, New York. And it's basically like, uh, it's like a, it's a frozen yogurt, but it's healthy. And it's like six ingredients, five, six ingredients, super delicious, very low calorie for yogurt. Um, and the CEO of that company and I got connected and He's a really interesting guy, really great business. And at one point he said to me, you know, my goal is for all of our customers to own a blend jet. And in fact, they started selling blend jets through Press Juicery, which was incredible because they don't sell products like that in their store. Um, but, you know, he said to me that he has a young daughter and one of his favorite things is every day he and his daughter have sort of, you know, daddy daughter time and they make uh, something together in the blend jet. And just hearing all of that, you know, and then doing a deal with him, and his, and his company and, and being in press juicery 
I love that brand. I go there all the time. You know, I order it and put it in my freezer and I'll keep like eight or 10 of them in my freezer. And they make great juices too, which make great smoothies if you, you know, mix them in the blend jet with other ingredients. So, you know, stuff like that just comes out of nowhere. That's totally unexpected. And uh, we've got some partnerships with some names that a lot of people know that are coming out next year for special editions and things like that. And these all have just come out of nowhere. So as much as it is a chore for a lot of people to try to get through all their emails for me, it's a treasure chest. I open it up and I'm like, all right, what do we got today? And there's really not a day that goes by where there isn't something that blows my mind. Well, the thing and is I'll, you I'll read them. That's a, that, you know, a lot of people who send <laughs> these emails, they, they, they don't dream that the, well, the founder and the CEO is going to read these emails, but they're sending it because they feel good about the product. Totally. And I, I respond to almost everyone that emails me. There are uh, some people that I don't respond to, um, you know, but for the most part, you know, random LinkedIn invites, you know, you're probably not going to get a response from me, but, um, but, you know, if you send me a thoughtful email, I'm, I'm probably going to respond to you. And my, my email is pretty easy to guess. I don't really want to tell everyone what it is right now, but I think that, um, you know, I, I try to be helpful because there's so many people who have been helpful to me, uh, in the past. Um, and, you know, I've cold contacted a lot of people. It's very popular to cold contact people now. Um, but I used to do it when it wasn't popular and people were much more willing to be helpful. And I was really good back in the day at like finding phone numbers of, uh, people who, were very interesting. I actually found the phone number of Steve Wozniak uh, when I was about 13 and I called him. I forgot, I was on the East Coast, so I forgot about the time difference and I called him <laughs> very early in the morning. I actually stayed up all night to wait to call him when I thought it was appropriate, which I forgot, you know, was three hours earlier. So he actually answered because he thought it was like an emergency. And then he and I talked and then he ended up sending me a bunch of free Apple stuff that I asked for. I asked him if he could send a letter to Steve Jobs that I wrote to Steve Jobs. And he said, yeah, I don't know if he's going to give you that stuff, but send it to me. I'll see what I can do. And he sent me all this stuff. Right. And it was just, and I found out later he paid for it, hardware, software. And the way I found out he paid for it is years later, I'm on a flight. I, it was the first time in my life I got upgraded, you know, finally all the airline miles did something for me. So I got to fly first class on Delta and I'm putting up my MacBook pro overhead and I look back and it's Steve Wozniak sitting behind me. And I'm just like, oh my God, this is like, oh my God, I can't believe it. You know, I love this guy. And I feel, I try to be generous with my time as much as I can, right? Either, I wish I could create more time. Unfortunately, it's a finite resource, but he created time for me when I was young and he was, you know, really generous with me. And um, I said to him, hey, uh, Woz, <laughs> as if I am allowed to call him, <laughs> by that, uh, Mr. Waz, um, I said, hey, I, I just got to introduce myself and I got to say thank you because I have a sense of generosity instilled in me that comes from a generous act from you of your time and, and helping me get stuff, hardware, software. You know, my parents wouldn't let me buy Mac stuff because they thought it was a fad at the time, which is, you know, hilarious. Um, but, uh, you know, I thanked him for that. And he really liked that. It really meant a lot. And afterwards he said, I'm not a social media user, believe it or not today. Uh, I just don't have time. I haven't been for years, but um, at the time I did. And when we got off the flight, he said, Hey, you want to take a picture together? So we did. And I posted it on Facebook. And then he friended me a few hours later, actually 30 minutes later when I was in the car on the way home from the airport. And, uh, and he, he friended me on Facebook and said, Hey, do you want to come have lunch on Saturday? And you want to play Segway Polo and all these things I got to do with him <laughs> and get to know him and, you know, meet people that were on the original Macintosh team. I mean, it was like, I was living in a dream, you know, and I was in my early twenties at the time. So it was, it was a pretty extraordinary experience. And then it comes full circle with my last company, you know, when I was at Meta, um, because then I'm in a green room at a conference and it's, Steve Wozniak and it's Guy Kawasaki and it's Damon John and it's me. And we're the four keynote speakers of this conference. And I'm sitting there with Steve Wozniak and I'm like, do you remember, you know, the crazy, like, you know, when I woke you up in the middle of the night and then when I met you on the airplane and 
now here we are, you know, all these years later. Um, I mean, it all just feels like a dream, you know? And uh, I think I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for people like Waz being generous with his time, you know? And, and people like that being willing to speak to me. I was like a little kid. Why, why are you talking to me? But, you know, he at his core is, is an educator and a helper. And he just wants to help everybody. And um, that's his nature. And I think it, it's very inspiring. It was inspiring to me and it continues to be inspiring today. So, you know, I, I really do try to help people when they reach out. And uh, I talked to an e-commerce entrepreneur the other day who actually our accountant introduced us to, who's another client. And I thought she was a really small brand. I didn't think she was going to be a big brand. Um, you know, I thought they were just getting started and I give her all this advice and she's like, I can tell she's like feverishly taking notes. And then, you know, she goes, well, yeah, by the way, our revenue, um, last month was a million dollars. I'm like, what, what I, you know, I'm giving you all this advice. Like you don't know anything. And here you are doing seven figures a month in revenue, you know? Um, so it's, it's super interesting because, you know, we, she's followed up with me and I've made a lot of introductions to really important vendors of ours that I know are going to fundamentally help her business and, and change her, her business and her future. Um, and she's super grateful. Right. And I, I don't get anything for that. And I don't want anything. Um, I owe it to her, even though I don't know her, I owe it to her because people have done that for me before. And uh, I'm, it I'm not going to, right. yeah, I'm paying it forward. You know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's karma or, you know, anything like that. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But I do like that movie, uh, you know, and I think paying it forward is, is the right thing to do. And, you know, I don't know that it comes back to me directly. I don't really care, but it feels like the right thing to do because it's what other people have done for me. And, um, you know, as much as I can, I will. And, uh, you know, I am going to be busy working on what comes after Blanchett 2. Uh, and I am going to be busy working on all these things, but I'll find time to, uh, do, you know, do some good in terms of providing great introductions or great advice to people who are, you know, on track to, to do great things in their lives. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for all of these words of wisdom. The website um, is blendjet.com. The Blendjet 2 out now. Congratulations on all the success, Ryan. And uh, we look forward to seeing what's next. Thank you. Cheers to you and to all of your listeners. And uh, a real pleasure. <laughs>